Exiting 2012, a shift in the meta that had been present for the past year was starting to creep in. Though a majority of the year had been dominated by the Triangle format decks, Abyss Rising at the tail end of the year brought a new competitor to the table in Mermail, which appeared to be poised to challenge the long-standing champions of the metagame. This led us into the first set of the year, and if Abyss Rising gave us the water threat we've been needing, the next set would bring the fire to combat it. Cosmo Blazer. Release date, January 25th, 2013. Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, Noble Knight, Fire Fist, Mermail. Impact, the fire to Mermail's water. Cosmo Blazer would kick the year off with a core set focused on introducing a new fire archetype to the game to help combat the powerful Mermails introduced last set, while also bringing waves of support for previously introduced archetypes to help boost their playability into the metagame. The new archetype was Fire Fist, a series of fire beast warriors centered around their interactions with the fire formation series of continuous spells and traps. This first wave gave us Bear, who sets a fire formation spell from deck when he deals damage and can send a fire formation spell trap to grave to pop a monster on field. Gorilla, who sets a fire formation spell from deck when it destroys a monster in battle, able to send a fire formation spell trap to grave to pop a spell or trap. Dragon, who sets a fire formation trap from deck when a fire formation spell trap is activated and can send two fire formation spell traps to grave to revive a fire fist. Tiger King, a beast warrior locked rank 4 that sets a fire formation spell trap from deck on summon, can detach to negate all non-beast warriors on field until the end of the turn, and when sent to grave can send three fire formation spell traps to grave to summon two lower level beast warriors with the same attack from deck. All of the fire formation spells and traps share an effect to boost beast warriors attacks by a value while face up, being 100 for spells and 300 for traps, with each having an additional effect, with Tenki searching a lower level beast warrior on activation, Tensu giving an additional normal of a beast warrior every turn, Tensen boosting a beast warrior by 700 that turn on activation, and Tenken negating a beast warrior's effects but making it immune to cards other than itself on activation. We also received a few more pieces in the OCG import slots, being Horse Prince, a level 6 synchro that summons a level 3 fire from deck on synchro summon, Lion Emperor, a fire locked rank 3 that can detach one to recur a fire from grave to hand, and Spirit, a level 3 tuner that revives a level 3 200 or less defense fire on normal summon. Fire Fist gave a solid introduction wave here, but was clearly being pulled in two different directions, being a rank 4 focused deck between Bear, Gorilla, and Tiger King, and a level 3 strategy with Spirit, Lion Emperor, and Horse Prince. Though notably, even though there were other level 3 Fire Fists in the set, there were currently no in-archetype monsters that Spirit could revive other than another copy of itself. Because of the split in focus, two different versions of Fire Fist would be created, known as 3-axis and 4-axis, named for which level that version focused on, with 4 access being the only playable version at this stage, heavily relying on Bear to do the heavy lifting of the deck as clearly the best main deck piece. In addition to this, Tenki would move to see play outside of Fire Fist as well due to effectively being a Beast Warrior Rota, filling a niche no other card really had filled at that stage, and would continue to see play in any Beast Warrior focused deck for a long period of time after. Moving into archetypes that received new support, Noble Knight is the first TCG exclusive archetype that has technically been around for some time at this stage, seeing roughly 1-2 to two cards per core set released since Galactic Overlord. However, most of their cards seemed completely disjointed from each other thus far. This set would introduce their first decent wave of support to give the strategy an actual direction to move in, so let's talk about it. Noble Knight Madrot is a level 4 light warrior that becomes a level 5 dark warrior while equipped with a noble arm spell, and can, if equipped, summon a noble knight from deck and pop its equipped spell, which triggers the float effect of the noble arm spells. In addition to this, Noble Arms Calburn boosts the equipped monster by 500, can boost the controller's life points by 500 on a soft once per turn, and when destroyed can re-equip itself to a Noble Knight on a hard once per turn. Lastly, Artorgus King of the Noble Knights is a Noble Knight locked rank 4 that, on Exceed Summon, equips up to 3 Noble Arms from Grave to himself, and can detach to pop spells and traps on the field up to the number of Noble Arms equipped to himself. Noble Knight at this stage is still far from being considered a meta contender, but this would be the first wave of support for the deck to be considered a good direction for the strategy, being held back by the lack of good Noble Arms spells and the lack of good targets for Madrot Summon at this stage. Mermail would also see a solid second wave of support here in Abyssdine, able to summon herself if searched while you control a Mermail, able to revive a level 3 or lower Mermail if summoned by a Mermail effect, 
Abyss Lead, able to summon itself from hand by discarding three other waters, able to recur an Abyss Spell Trap engraved to hand on summon, and can rip a card from the opponent's hand by tributing another Mermail. Abyss Strite, a 3 material rank 3 that can detach to change an effect target to itself and revive a Mermail on destruction, and Abysteus, a TCG exclusive that can summon itself by discarding another water and searches a Mermail when summoned this way. This wave would fill the in archetype void in terms of swarming, especially for level 3 and 7s with Dine and Tia specifically. With Tia's being an absolutely insane piece of support to boost the deck up further into the meta with both its easier summon than Megalo and its search on summon. In addition to this, Trite gives the archetype a good target to summon using Bahamut Shark, which was always an option for the deck to make but lacked a solid target to summon. This support would make Mermail even more of a threat in the metagame than it already was, which we'll see soon enough. Prophecy would receive a couple of new pieces, with the most notable being Master, able to copy the effect of a normal spellbook engrave as long as you control at least one spellcaster on the field and can reveal another spellbook in hand, allowing the chain that began with Blue Boy and Secrets to continue further, allowing spellbook decks to get additional counters onto Star Hall and additional names into the grave for fate. Diamond Dire Wolf is a new rank 4 staple piece that can pop a tri-type you control and a card the opponent controls, able to pop itself with this effect, becoming the go-to rank 4 removal option. Lightning Chidori is a wind-locked rank 4 that spins a set card to the bottom of the deck on summon and can detach to stack a face-up card on top of the deck, an insanely powerful option for wind decks, though there were none in the meta at the time. Crimson Blader is a level 8 OCG import synchro that, if it destroys a monster in battle, locks the summoning of high level monsters from the opponent the following turn, which while not useful on release will become extremely relevant within the next few months. Breakthrough Skill is a trap that negates the effects of a face-up monster that turn, then can be banished from Grave on your turn, except the turn it's put there, to do it again, becoming a solid option for multiple monster effect stuns. All in all, Cosmo Blazer, while not being a meta upheaval set, did many things right in pushing the meta slightly in a new direction, complemented by the structure deck release that came two weeks later. Onslaught of the Fire Kings. Release date, February 8th, 2013. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Fire King. Impact, another fire archetype, not nearly as relevant. Onslaught of the Fire Kings was the Fire Structure Deck counterpart to last year's Atlantean Water Structure Deck, and as such it introduced the Fire King archetype, a series of tri-typed fire monsters who were designed to be spiritual successors to Sacred Phoenix of Nethys from the DM era. With their boss monster, High Avatar Garunix, having an almost identical effect, reviving itself the turn after it's destroyed by card effect, nuking all monsters on the field when it did. In addition to him, Barong could search for a Fire King card the turn after it's destroyed by a card effect. Onslaught of the Fire King lets you, if you control no monsters and the opponent does, summon a Fire Tri-Type from deck, destroying it in the end phase, and Circle lets you pop a fire on field to revive a fire in grave, giving you easy access to Garonix as well as the original Nephthys with most of the enabling support. Unfortunately, the deck as it stood, while explosive, was extremely telegraphed and delayed in its impact, relegating the strategy to simply a rogue option for the time being. Reprints here included Sacred Phoenix of Nephthys, Manticore of Darkness, Rekindling, and Pot of Duality, with the Duality reprint being a solid inclusion for deck sales. YCS Miami would be held the next weekend, and Windup would once again reclaim its spot as top deck in the meta, including first place piloted by Travis Smith. Merlantian was right behind it though in representation, with a few players notably cutting Gen X Undyne from the list due to finally hitting that key point of enough good Mermail names to no longer need it, although a couple would still play it. Firefist would see its first top cut appearance here, notably playing Rescue Rabbit to access Vorse Raider for the Tiger King push, which would be iterated on in the coming weeks to instead be Gene Warped Warwolf, the strongest Beast Warrior normal monster. YCS Bokum would be held a week later, and while Windup would once again take the King Slice as well as the top spot piloted by Alpe Ingen, Firefist's popularity in the EU was a completely different story from its original performance stateside, with three different variants popping up, being the Rabbit variant we saw last week, a stun variant playing Beast King Barbaros, who could be boosted with the fire formations, and even a Fire King variant, utilizing the Fire King spell traps to access Bear, Gorilla, and even Flamvel Fire Dog. YCS Santiago would be held the same weekend, and if the US was leaning Mermail and the EU was leaning Firefist, then South America was clearly leaning towards Macro Rabbit, being the most popular deck of the event, taking first place piloted by Jose Raul. 
Macrocosmos tended to have a significantly positive matchup with the various decks in the format, due to most being reliant on the graveyard to set up either their main playlines or heavier recursion pieces, giving Macro Rabbit a good field to play against for this event specifically. Following the opening YCSs of the year, the ban list would be updated on March 1st, bringing a fairly small number of changes but without question being impactful ones. Newly banned were Sangan, a targeted hit at both its generic searchability as well as tour guide, and Windup Carriers and Mighty, effectively crushing the best extra deck monster in archetype for windups, but the hits would keep coming. Newly limited were Windup Magician, killing the board flooding of the deck as now you needed more gas than ever to access Shockmaster, One Day of Peace, heavily crippling the extension of alt wincon decks, and Solemn Warning, a staple piece of the Solemn Brigade as it was referred to, now matching its counterpart of Judgment. Newly semi-limited were Ryo, nerfing stun strategies fairly hard, Tsukiyomi, bringing back the GOAT format staple, and Advanced Ritual Art, as the Demise OTK was effectively gone for good now. Lastly, Unlimited were Kalut, Lumina, Minecrush, Spore, and Sheen Smoke Signal, all cards for decks of previous metagames that were, in fairness, mid for the current space. This particular ban list target was clearly wind up, and the two targeted hits at the deck landed powerfully, taking the meta powerhouse almost completely out of the scene, though would still see some play as a rogue to tier 3 strategy. At this time, we also received a couple of side releases that would mostly do nothing to the metagame, starting with Star Pack 2013 on March 1st, which changed nothing at all, followed by Zexel Collection 10 on March 8th, which did bring two new useful exceeds to the meta and Star Liege Paladynamo, a new rank 4 option for light strategies, and number 61 Volcasaurus, a new staple in the rank 5 slot. The first testing grounds of this new meta space would be YCS Austin on March 23rd, and with Windup almost completely gone, taking only one spot in the top cut here, Mermail was left to completely dominate the space, taking 15 of the top 32 in addition to first place piloted by Oscar Zelaya showcasing the current version of the deck, which had completely eliminated the Gen X package. Girgia would begin to see some movement here with Windup out of the picture, still utilizing Machina for instant threats of Fortress or the Karakuris for access to Synchro 7 and 8 pools. Probably the most interesting deck taking a spot here was the Electrum OTK, a newer OTK development that required just two cards to pull off, being Fusion Gate and Chain Material. By using Chain Material, you can fuse using materials in the deck and grave for the entire turn by banishing them, which meshes well with Fusion Gate allowing you to fuse as many times as you want in a turn, allowing you to fuse for Elemental Hero Electrum, who shuffles all banished monsters into deck on Fusion Summon, allowing you to make a second, shuffle again, overlay the two for Gustav Max, burn for 2000, fuse the Gustav in the graved Electrum for Gaia, the Gaia in the second Electrum for Shining, and then make a third Electrum to shuffle back all the materials to do it again, burning for game after four loops. YCS San Diego would be two weeks later on April 6th, though a disclosure needs to be made about the top cut breakdown here. Prior to top 32, players played using a Battle Pack Epic Dawn sealed draft deck, meaning that just because a deck is in the top cut here doesn't mean that the deck made it through by its own merit. Angel Asensio would take the event on Mermail, as to be expected due to the deck's popularity and power in the current format. Last event from this block was YCS San Jose two weeks later, and from the top 16, we'd see Firefist taking a split of the representation from Mermail, with bear control builds taking center stage, using the remainder of the Firefist pieces to effectively get yourself to bear. Jorge Valverde would take the event on Bubble Beat, showcasing the deck's ability to continue topping despite its hits from late 2012 by accessing bursts of power through Blade Armor Ninja and Absolute Zero. This would lead into the next Hidden Arsenal set release, and although the last couple had been quite underwhelming in the grand scheme, this one was set to upend all preconceived notions of failure. Hidden Arsenal 7, Night of the Stars. Release date, April 26, 2013. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, Constellar, Evil Swarm, Extra Deck Staples. Impact, and upheaval of the rank 4 pool. Hidden Arsenal 7 would be the final standalone Hidden Arsenal set for a long period of time, and the series was not about to just sit back and die quietly. It was set to go out with a massive bang by not only introducing two new strategies to the meta, but also by completely revolutionizing the generic exceed pool by giving most archetypes from the last couple of sets a generic exceed that did something uniquely powerful. Starting with Gem Knights, they wouldn't receive an exceed like most of the others, but would receive a couple of new key cards for later impact, like Lazuli, who adds a normal monster from grave to hand when sent to grave, 
Seraphonite, a fusion of a Gem Knight and a Light Monster that can provide an extra normal summon each turn, and Master Diamond, a fusion of three Gem Knights that can banish a level 7 or lower Gem Knight fusion from Grave to copy its name and effect that turn. Each of these would find important slots in Gem Knight strategies in the future, with Lazuli and Master Diamond becoming backbones of a Gem Knight OTK with the release in 2014, and Seraphonite finding a completely unexpected home in 2015, which we'll cover both when we get there. Laval would see a singular new relevant card, being Lavalval Chain, a rank 4 that could detach to either bin a card from deck or stack a monster on top of the deck. Without exaggeration or hyperbole, this is to this day considered one of the strongest exceeds ever printed, as it would do so much for so many strategies simply by being a foolish burial on legs, which would spark a complete revitalization of a certain strategy within the next few weeks. Gishki would be one of the strategies here that got a bit of the short end of the stick, but would receive one new boss monster, being Zeal Gigas, a level 10 ritual that could pay a thousand life to draw a card, then shuffle a card on field into deck if it was a Gishki monster. Zeal Gigas was yet another loop enabler for the deck, this time by being a draw tool that happened to be level 10, meaning it gave the deck access to Gustav Max, and stop me if you've heard this one before. Ironically though, this would not be the best card released for Gishki in this set, but we'll get there soon enough. Gusto would similarly receive a new Exceed tool, that being Die Gusto Emerald, a rank 4 that could detach to shuffle three monsters in Grave back into deck and draw one, being effectively a mini Pot of Avarice on legs, seeing play for that reason initially, but in later formats being an enabler for some of the most degenerate loops in the game's history. Constellar would be the first of the two new archetypes here, overtaking Vylon's Light Attribute slot, being a series of differently leveled Light monsters aimed at using level modulation to access their various extra deck bosses. These included Algady, who specials a Constellar from hand on normal, Pollux, who gives you an extra normal for a Constellar the turn it's normal summoned, Kaos, who could level modulate a Constellar by one twice per turn, Pleiades, a light locked rank five that could detach to bounce a card on a quick effect once per turn, and Ptolemy M7, a rank six that could be overlaid onto a Constellar Exceed, locking its other effect that turn if you do, and could detach one to bounce a monster from field or grave to hand once per turn. This strategy would, on release, see no play, as the primary issue it faced was consistency, as every monster that searched in archetype was not a level four, locking what plays you could do on the turn they're used. That isn't to say the deck would be locked in an unplayable camp forever, as some experimentation would be done with the deck regularly to attempt a Pleiades turbo strategy in addition to Ptolemy M7 entering the staple rank 6 pool immediately, helping many decks like Heratic, but also enabling loops with Gishki thanks to being makeable with Mind August and Gus Kraken, which is part of the reason Gus Kraken was limited so far in advance. The other new archetype here was Evil Swarm, the dark replacement for Steel Swarms, although more notably could be considered an upgraded version due to most of their support specifying L Swarm monsters, meaning that they work with both Evil Swarm and Steel Swarm strategies, though were clearly built for this one. This initial wave included Heliotrope, a normal level 4 for rabbit shenanigans, O-Lantern, who could tribute itself to pop a face-up monster, Mandragora, who could special itself if your opponent controls more monsters, Castor, who gives an additional normal the turn it's normaled, Thunderbird, who can banish itself when an effect is used and return itself in the next standby phase, their rank 4's Nightmare, who can detach to flip a monster that gets special summoned face down, Bahamut, who can detach and discard an L Swarm to steal an opponent's monster, Ophion, who locks level 5 and higher special summons while it has materials and can detach to search an infestation spell trap, or a Boros, a 3 mat that can detach to activate one of its effects, but only once each while on the field, being bouncing an opponent's card, hand ripping one, or banishing a card from the opponent's grave, Infestation Pandemic, a quick play spell that makes evil swarms immune to spell traps that turn, and Infection, which trades an L Swarm in hand or on field for another one in deck. There's probably one specific Exceed I mentioned there that stood out compared to the rest, and yes, Ophion Control became the name of the game for Evil Swarm strategies, matching up incredibly well into Mermail by locking them out of their level 7 Swarmers, but still being a bit of a bad matchup into the rest of the meta spread for now. YCS Lyle would be held the same weekend, and notably the new Hidden Arsenal set seemed to make zero impact on the scene, with Mermails continuing to dominate the meta, taking first place here piloted by Long Dao, incorporating the Gen X package back in. However, the set would see an impact on YCS Meadowlands two weeks later on May 12th, and this particular event is regularly revisited in Retroplay due to its shocking diversity following Hidden Arsenal 7's release. With a couple of new decks popping up from these pieces, the first, and most obvious, was Evil Swarm, sporting a Rescue Rabbit package here to access Ophion quickly and reliably, sporting a whole suite of back row to play Defend the Castle once summoned. 
including one of the first big appearances of Safe Zone in the metagame. A choice that would grow more popular later in the year with the release of another Exceed to help Evil Swarm's game plan. The other big shakeup was the first appearance of Exceed Infernity, using Rank 4 swarming enablers like Summoner Monk and Stygian Street Patrol to get you to the Lavalval Chain quickly, who in turn set up your grave for your singular copy of Launcher to do as much work as it possibly could, or to stack Archfiend on top of the deck for its own summon effect to trigger. Tyree Tinsley would take the event on Mermail, once again showing the consistent power of the meta threat, back to cutting the Gen X package out. Unfortunately to many players, Meadowlands format is also known as the end of early Zexal, as many decks that were viable here, the great diversity that had been cultivated, and the vibe that almost any strategy could compete was about to be completely shattered, as the player base braced itself for what we've known was coming for months. We were about to enter the Dragon's Den. Lord of the Tachyon Galaxy. Release date, May 17th, 2013. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Dragon Ruler, Spellbook, Mecha Phantom Beast. Impact, the meta capsizes. Let's be completely fair on this one. Anyone who knows any bit of the history of this game knows that this particular set would be the first of a couple major turning points in the game's history. Starting here, and moving into the next year of releases, Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game would shift from the core concepts of the early years into what we really know now as the modern version of the game, and it all started with the release of the Dragon Rulers. The Dragon Rulers are a series of level 7 dragons, one of each elemental attribute, being Redox for Earth, Tidal for Water, Blaster for Fire, and Tempest for Wind each sharing the same three abilities. Able to summon themselves from hand or grave by banishing two monsters that are either dragons or their attribute from hand or grave. Able to search a dragon of their attribute when banished, and each having a unique ability that activates by discarding themselves with another monster of their attribute. With Redox reviving a monster, Tidal dumping a monster from deck, Blaster popping a card on field, and Tempest searching for any dragon, with each only being able to use one of these effects a turn. In addition, they each had a baby counterpart that could be discarded alongside any monster that's either a dragon or shares its attribute to summon its corresponding dragon ruler from deck. These cards would completely upend the established metagame, taking over and dominating the game for the remainder of the year, and with many considering the impending format of dragon ruler format to be one of the most skill-intensive formats of all time which we'll go more in-depth on with the next major tournament. In the meantime, though, an extremely notable point for the deck here was that the Dragon Ruler cards themselves maxed out at the rare rarity slot, making the entire archetype shockingly cheap for the time. However, because of this, the entire value of the deck, in turn, quickly pumped into the Rank 7 Extra Deck pool, with the previously released Big Eye spiking immediately on reveal that these would be low rarity. A similar fate would befall the Mecha Phantom Beast cards released here, an archetype of monsters focused around summoning and utilizing their archetypal tokens, with Tether Wolf being a level 4 that summons a token and adds the level of all tokens onto itself, making itself a level 7 on summon, and their rank 7 exceed Draco Sack, who can detach a material to summon two tokens and contribute Mecha Phantom Beast cards to pop a card on field once per turn. Unable to be destroyed by battle or card effect while you control a token, Dracosac would instantly hit the $100 plus club, being one of the best extra deck monsters to summon using the Dragon Rulers, who also formed an interesting dynamic with Big Eye specifically, forming a mind game between players in the mirror match, while Tether Wolf would be a normal summon tech for some builds able to access Draco Sack with a token already on field for protection. Fire Fist would receive Leopard, a level 3 200 defense monster that could tribute itself to set a fire formation from deck, notable for both being summonable with Rekindling and Spirit, beginning the waves of support for the theorized 3-axis deck. Harpy would be the next major DM era archetype to receive the legacy support treatment, seeing Channeler, who could discard a Harpy card to summon another Harpy from deck, becoming a level 7 if you controlled a dragon, and Hysteric Sign, which searched Elegant Egotist on activation and searched for up to three different Harpies in the end phase of the turn it's put in grave. Both of these would be insanely strong pieces to make Harpy a viable rank 4 and 7 strategy, especially with the previously released Lightning Chidori, but unfortunately was competing with the strongest rank 7 strategy ever in the same set, as well as the already meta one. Speaking of, Mermail would receive Abyss Ocea, able to trade a Mermail on field for any number in deck whose total level equals that monster's, and Abyss Scale of the Mizuchi, providing a spell negation on resolution of activation, both being powerful tools for Mermail to adapt with. Madolce would receive Hootcake, 
a level 3 beast that could special summon a Madolce from deck by banishing a monster in Grave. Specifically useful for summoning Messengelato from deck to trigger its search effect with a Madolce beast already being on board. King of the Feral Limps is a rank 4 that searches for any reptile monster, becoming a staple part of various extra decks over the next few years by being able to grab a random reptile extender for strategies. Sacred Sword of 7 Stars can banish a level 7 in hand to draw 2, being a draw tool that felt almost tailor-made for dragon rulers to use and abuse. Girgia Gear is a trap that could summon two Girgiano monsters from deck, boosting their levels by 1, giving you instant access to the rank 4 exceed pool while also increasing the playability of the previously overlooked level 3 Girgias. Mind Drain was the third of the Drain Continuous Traps, able to prevent effects in hand from activating, locking hand traps and some summon effects. Totem Bird was a TCG exclusive Wind Locked Rank 3, able to negate a spell trap by detaching two, seeing some play in later Rank 3 Wind strategies. Noble Arms of Destiny is yet another solid Noble Arms spell, giving its monster protection from destruction once per turn, slotting into the Noble Knight strategy instantly. Constellar and Evil Swarm would see their OCG imports here in Sombre and Kerkion, who had the same effect just for their respective archetypes, able to banish an archetypal monster in Grave to add another to hand, then providing an additional normal summon that turn for their archetype. Of the two, Kirikion would see the immediate success thanks to Evil Swarm already being a popular option in the meta, giving another tool to turbo into Ophion. Though Constellar would also receive Omega, a light locked rank 4 that can detach to make Constellars immune to spells and traps that turn, becoming a solid rank 4 option for light decks in general. Lastly, and by far the most important card outside of the Dragon Rulers themselves, Spellbook of Judgment could, at the end of the turn you activate it, Search for different spellbooks for each spell you activated after its resolution, and summon a spellcaster monster whose level is equal to or lower than the number you added. This was one of the biggest resource plusing cards ever printed, able to reliably reach 3 plus spellbooks off of its activation, and summon a powerful spellcaster afterward, commonly reaching either Jowgen to lock special summons or Kaiku to lock banishing from the grave against dragon rulers. This one card would push spellbooks from their previously tier 3 level status to the go-to deck that wasn't named Dragon Rulers, which we'll discuss more about soon enough. Following Tachyon, there would be a couple of much smaller releases, starting with Superstarter V for Victory almost a month later, being the year starter deck and containing no new cards worth talking about. The second would be the second battle pack, War of the Giants, two weeks after the starter decks which was mostly notable for shifting what set was played for sealed events moving forward, but also for having a couple of interesting reprints, such as Card Card D, Mermail Abyss Megalo, Pot of Duality, and Breakthrough Skill. The WC circuit for the year would be shortly after this release, starting with the European WCQ on June 29th, and although we do not have a full picture of the top cut like we would like, there was a clear winner for the new top deck of the format. Dragon Ruler had taken over, with most builds already centralizing around a few specific cards. The first point was the ratios of the rulers to babies was already fairly set, seeing three of each ruler and two of each baby across multiple lists. The second was the inclusion of Super Rejuvenation at its maximum three copies commonly, as by discarding with the baby effects, you would receive two draws at the end of the turn with Rejuvenation, or four if you used two baby effects that turn which in turn could get you to another Rejuvenation, which as a quick play spell could be activated in the end phase after drawing it to draw even more. The third was Gold Sarcophagus, which was being played at 2-3 copies, able to banish a ruler from the deck to trigger its search effect for a baby, which in turn got you to the main ruler regardless, and the inclusion of level 1 tuners like Effect Feeler and Dragoonity Corsesca to access the level 8 Synchro Pool, specifically Crimson Blader, who locked up the mirror match itself quite effectively. Fourth, and probably most telling for the future of the game, was a specific card that found its way into a few side decks here, being Vanity's Emptiness. The trap from Shining Darkness was finally being recognized for the power it represented, allowing you to set up your board with the rulers, then flip this on your opponent's turn to block them from doing the same. This was extra effective in the mirror match at this point, as few players played back row removal in the deck outside of the singular heavy storm, meaning to out it, commonly one would need Blaster and another Fire to do the job. However, very notably, Dragon Ruler would not take the event overall, with that honor going to Chris Bodolaudis on Spellbook, playing a large suite of 26 spells to chain activations after Judgment to activate the various tools to counter Dragon Ruler's dominance in the format, with both Jowgen and Kaiku locking different aspects of the deck. Jowgen specifically would be a really interesting piece here, as its 1300 defense body actually proved to be rather difficult to out for Dragon Rulers, as the only normal summon in the deck that could do it natively was Stream, being 1600 attack. 
meaning that outside of that, the only reliable card to out it was similarly the Blaster Pop. Evil Swarm would also perform quite well here for two major reasons. The first, and most obvious, was Ophion locking the Dragon Ruler summons in addition to the summon of High Priestess from the Spellbook matchup, only being outable by a few specific cards thanks to Infestation Pandemic providing protection, which was searchable by Ophion. The second, and less obvious to the naked eye, was the price point. With the entire deck being effectively found in Hidden Arsenal 7, the deck was shockingly affordable compared to its competitors, which led to the deck's performance being boosted, even though it was clearly the weakest of the three. The South American WCQ would take place the same weekend, and a lot of the points we've just discussed would be present here too, with rulers taking 15 top spots, followed by Spillbooks at 8 and Evil Swarm at 7, though notably all 7 Evil Swarm would be eliminated moving into top 16. Carlos Perez would take the event on Dragon Rulers, playing a similar build to what we saw in Europe, but notably including two copies of Breakthrough Skill as a way to out Ophion's lock with the two vanities in the side for locking out the mirror match. The Central American WCQ would be a week later, and at this stage, Dragon Rulers and Spellbooks had narrowed the field around them to a knockout dragout war between the two titans, with Alejandro Suarez taking the event on Rulers, who did not make his list public. While there was one more WCQ event with coverage we can go through, there would be one more set release prior to it occurring, and though it wouldn't bring too much new to the table, it would be important to cover it for one card that would change the dynamic of Dragon Rulers heavily. Number Hunters. Release date, July 11th, 2013. Set type, Import Set. Major Strategies, Various OCG Exclusive Exceeds. Impact, a couple of interesting exceeds for the pool. Number Hunters was probably one of the most out-of-nowhere sets for us to receive, right up there with Star Pack just a little bit earlier this year. In reality, the set was an import set to catch us up with some of the OCG's exclusive exceeds monsters up to this point, most of which were incredibly niche, but held their uses, such as number 49 Fortune Tune as a Time Win Con, number 85 Crazy Box as a Drain Beat Boss, Mechquipped Engineer as a Stall Option, Coach King Giant Trainer as a draw tool for rank 8 strategies, and, most importantly for our context, number 74 Master of Blades, a rank 7 that can negate and destroy a card that targets it, popping another card on field when it does. This would solve a major issue with the Dragon Ruler Mirror Match, that being what threat to make going first. For most matchups, going first you'd want to make Draco Sack to set up a wall protected by its tokens, but in the mirror match, this could be completely upended by the summon of an opposing big eye, stealing the Draco Sack and making the situation far worse. Master of Blades solves that issue, giving the deck a turn 1 option that didn't lose to Big Eye, which we'd see soon enough. The North American WCQ would be held the same weekend, and, shockingly, we'd see Dragon Ruler continue to dominate the space, taking first place piloted by Patrick Hoban, notably main decking two copies of Vanity's Emptiness, prepping for the mirror in the main deck, as it was reasonably going to be the most common matchup. This would end the WCQ circuit for the year and lead into the next core set prior to the World Championships in a month, and any hope of seeing a meta not dominated by Dragon Rulers would entirely rest on this new set. Judgment of the Light Release date, August 9th, 2013 Set type, Core Set Major Strategies, Bujin, Trap Tricks, Fire Fist Impact, setting up the meta half a year away. Judgment of the Light is an odd set looking back on it in retrospect, not because it was bad, not by a long shot, but because even though a number of strategies released here would be meta, they were completely overshadowed on release due to the dragons raging in the background. The first of the new strategies of note was Bujin, a series of Beast Warrior Bujins and Beast and Winged Beast Bujinjis with the Bujinjis providing some benefit to a Beast Warrior Bujin on the board by either discarding themselves or banishing themselves from grave. This initial wave included Yamato, who could add a Bujin from deck to hand in the end phase, discarding a Bujin if you did, Quillen, able to be banished from grave while you control a Beast Warrior Bujin to pop a face-up card, Turtle, able to banish itself from grave to negate a card that targets a Bujin, Crane, able to discard itself to double a Beast Warrior Bujin's attack in the damage step, Susanowo, a Bujin locked rank 4 that can attack all monsters once each and can detach to either search or dump a Bujin, and Bujin Carnation, which summons a Bujin from Grave and the Banished Zone while you control no monsters but the opponent does. Bujin was one of the strongest examples ever of a helmet deck, basically aiming to stick Yamato and throw all protection onto it, being a simple concept of get the helmet and put on the damn helmet. An incredibly basic strategy, but had bones, needing a couple more worthwhile main deck Beast Warrior Bujins to be worth it. 
The other new archetype here was Trap Tricks, a series of earth insects and plants that interact with the normal trap hole cards, like the classic trap hole and the meta staple bottomless trap hole, all being immune to whole normal traps. This first wave included Mermello, who searched a whole normal trap on normal summon and pops a spell trap on special summon, Nepenthes, who searches or summons a Trap Tricks from the deck if you activate a whole normal trap, and Trap Tricks Trap Hole Nightmare, a trap that negates and destroys a special summoned monster that activates an effect the turn it's summoned. This archetype did hold potential out the gate thanks to Mermello searching the ever popular bottomless on normal summon, but would clearly need more support to do anything impactful in the metagame. Firefist would receive its most pivotal wave of support yet, being Rooster, an OCG import that, if special summoned by a Firefist effect, searches a Firefist monster, able to send a Fire Formation to Grave to set another from deck. This would be the piece that finally brought the three axis version of the deck together, able to search a copy of Spirit on Revive from a copy of Spirit or an initial summon from Horse Prince, cycle a Fire Formation, then either make a rank 3 or a level 6 synchro, giving the strategy the follow up potential it needed so badly. Unfortunately, the support would be too late for the deck to do anything relevant due to the environment around it and the next ban list, which would take effect prior to the first YCS it could potentially do anything at. Moving into other cards in the set, Galaxy Surfeit was a normal level 2 dragon tuner, useful for some heretic and dragon strategies for hitting certain levels in the extra deck. Mass Chameleon revives a zero defense monster on summon, providing synchro and exceed access for specific strategies that happen to be searchable by King of the Feral Limps, which would come up in later formats. Flying C was the next C hand trap, able to summon itself to the opponent's board and lock exceed summons, seeing some experimentation. Armadie's Keeper of Boundaries was the newest Synchro 5 staple, able to stun effects while attacking, seeing play in any deck that could make him. Star Eater was a level 11 Synchro whose summon couldn't be stopped or responded to and became immune to card effects while attacking, becoming an option for the Dragon Ruler extra deck using level 4 tuners, like the Buri Dragon. Number 66, Master Key Beetle, was a dark locked rank 4 that could detach to select a card on field, protecting that card from destruction while on the field and able to pop a protected card to protect itself, seeing play in Evil Swarm decks thanks to its ability to become an invincible threat by hitting Safe Zone onto itself, or to permanently lock special summons by targeting Vanity's Emptiness. Herald of Pure Light is a rank 2 that can add a card in Grave back to hand, then shuffle a card in hand back into deck, being a decent recursion option for rank 2 decks. Transmodify was probably one of the most interesting pieces to experiment with from this set, able to send a monster to grave to summon a monster of the same type and attribute but one level higher from deck, seeing experimentation with multiple strategies from Agents to Dark World, but finding a home in Infernity of all things due to being able to change a spent Necromancer into an Archfiend. Cockadoodle Doo was a TCG exclusive that could be a level 3, 4, or 5 based on how you summon it, being an interesting tuner for some decks to play with. Noble Knight Driston would be the first solid target to summon with Madrot, able to pop a face-up card on field when equipped with a Noble Arms spell, which would naturally happen through Madrot's effect popping its equip on summon. Coach Soldier Wolf Bark was an OCG import that could revive a level 4 Fire Beast Warrior in Grave, being a rank 4 enabler specifically for Fire Fist and Fire King decks. Speaking of, Fire King Avatar Yaksha was an OCG import that could destroy a monster on field or in hand on destruction, being a solid enabler for Fire King that the deck was desperately missing. Lastly, Fencing Fire Ferret can, upon being destroyed, pop a face-up monster and burning the opponent, being an option for countering out specific meta threats. The 2013 Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship would be held the same weekend, and unsurprisingly, with all of the pieces of the deck available in both regions, Dragon Ruler absolutely dominated this tournament taking 6 of the top 8, leaving only 2 spots for spellbooks. Huang Xian of Taiwan would take the event with the aforementioned Dragon Rulers, claiming the title of World Champion for 2013, but there was one specific inclusion in his build that would be noted for all future iterations of the deck, that being Dragon Ravine, the Dragoonity field spell. Ravine had one major purpose here, help load Dragon Rulers into the graveyard, as by discarding a card once per turn, you could effectively gain a repeatable Foolish Burial for the deck which would continue to see play long after this event. It also had the side benefit of searching Corsesca if you needed a level 1 tuner. Following the world's performance of Dragon Ruler, the 2013 Collector's Tens would begin dropping, reprinting Blaster and Title in a much higher secret rarity, alongside super rare reprints of Karakuri Bure, Gagaga Cowboy, Firefist Bear, BLS, Cataster, and Gustav Max, with the latter being notable for releasing the card into the EU region for the first time. However, the far more culturally significant impact, in fact the arguably most significant impact of all of 2013 on the game, would take place shortly after on September 1st, 
being on the surface another ban list update, but this one was far different than any that came before it. Up until this point, the TCG ban list was a direct one-to-one -one copy of the OCG's ban list, which, notably, meant that we were receiving hits months in advance of the releases they were actually put in place for. Starting with this ban list, the TCG and OCG would officially split from each other, with the TCG now updating their ban list completely separately from the OCG, commonly referred to as the TCG-OCG split in the player base. Ironically, this would also be the largest ban list in the history of the game so far, seeing 15 bans, 18 limits, 5 semi-limits, and 9 unlimits, for a total of 47 changes in all. So let's dive in. Newly banned were the four baby rulers and super rejuvenation, directly targeted at kneecapping dragon rulers, elemental hero Stratos, aimed at the various hero beat decks, number 16 Shockmaster, the final nail in the coffin for windup, card destruction, the power play card of Dark Worlds, Gateway of the Six, putting an end to six samurai's pop-up nature, Heavy Storm, Monster Reborn, Pot of Avarice, and Solemn Judgment, hits to the meta staples, Spellbook of Judgment, killing the modern iteration of spellbooks outright, and Ultimate Offering, a spam summon card that hadn't caused many issues yet, but was clearly a ticking time bomb. Newly limited were Atlantean Dragoons and Deep Sea Diva as hit to Merlantian, Firefist Spirit as a hit to Three Axis, Constellar Ptolemy M7 and Evagishki Mind August hits to a Gishki loop, Doloren to prevent more loops, Genex Ally Birdman as a staple tuner, Rescue Rabbit, the cornerstone of various rank 4 strategies, Thunder King Ryo, Dimensional Fissure, Royal Tribute, Eradicator Epidemic Virus, Macrocosmos, and Soul Drain all as hits to stun decks, Gold Sarcophagus as a hit to Dragon Rulers, and Bottomless, Compulse, and Torrential as hits to the staple trapline. Newly semi-limited were Tenki, a hit to Beast Warrior decks, Dimensional Prison, a hit to the staple trap, and Mizuki, Plague Spreader, and TG Striker all coming back from one. Lastly, unlimited were Destiny Hero Malicious, The Agent of Mystery Earth, Tsukiyomi, A Hero Lives, Black Whirlwind, E Emergency Call, Erratic Seal of Convocation, Pot of Duality, and Scapegoat, being a wave of cleanup. Needless to say, something was bound to change here, but on reveal, even though a lot was hit, there were glaring omissions. Even though the rulers lost the babies, Rejuve, and two of their gold sarks, the deck remained shockingly competent with all four rulers still legal at three copies each. And now that spellbooks were out of the way, there was no deck to really stand up against them. YCS Brussels would be held the same day as this list, though notably wouldn't be affected by it due to being a sealed pack YCS, using the new War of the Giants draft pack. These YCSs are always the more interesting to cover thanks to dispelling the rumor that drafting is all luck when in reality it is heavily built on the back of deck building skill, which we'd see thanks to the finals being between some of EU's most consistent faces at the time, being Peter Gross and Michael Gruner, with Gruner taking the event in a 2-1 finals match, claiming the YCS title and the first copy of the newest YCS prize card, number 106 Giant Hand. This particular prize card reveal was a little controversial, as in recent years the prize card has been decent, but not something you'd really want to play in a meta deck, as compared to the SJC days where prize cards were extremely meta relevant and caused many issues in pricing. This time though, Giant Hand, while not the strongest rank 4 out there, did fill a niche in the rank pool by providing monster effect negation, leaning it to actually see play during its prize card stint run, much to the horror of budget players. YCS Toronto would be held the same day, and this event would paint a much more clear picture of the meta fallout, with there being no real top deck following the hits, seeing a new variant of Dragon Rulers, that being Dragon Ruler Plants, rise into the top meta position, though not in a convincing manner. The deck had pivoted to focus more on the Synchro Pool axis that had been experimented with prior, adding in more tuners than just the odd level 1s this time, like the Bree Dragon, in addition to the level modulating tuners like Spore giving you access to the level 11 pool for Star Eater. Spellbooks would pivot back to their own boss monsters for an endgame, such as High Priestess and World, giving the deck a far different feel than it had pre-ban list. Dragoonity Ruler would be the other interesting development here, leaning hard into the recently discovered Dragon Ravine to not only fuel the rulers, but also to access the level 8 Synchro Pool easily through Ducks and Phalanx, making it to top 4 here. Edward Kuang would take the event on a more pure variant of Dragon Rulers, though notably still playing Dandelion from the plant package, just not the rest of it, also leaning into the Dragon Ravine discovery himself. Though the top cut here feels a lot more diverse than it was before, in reality 7 of the top 16 were just different flavors of Ruler, showing that despite the hits, nothing had really changed about them being the best deck, 
with the only question being which variant to play. And another variant was about to throw their hat into the ring with the next structure deck releasing two weeks later. Saga of Blue Eyes White Dragon. Release date, September 13th, 2013. Set type, Structure Deck. Major strategies, Blue Eyes. Impact, another variant on the pile. Saga of Blue Eyes was an interestingly timed Structure Deck, releasing a wave of new support for Blue Eyes and general Dragon support right at a time when dragons were more popular than ever. For Blue Eyes specifically, they received Maiden with Eyes of Blue, a tuner that, if attacked, summoned a Blue Eyes White Dragon from Hand, Deck, or Grave negates the attack, and swaps her battle position, and if targeted, summons a Blue Eyes as well, being a casual player's worst nightmare, requiring non-targeted, non-battle removal, or the ability to deal with both her and the dragon she summons. They also received Azure Eyes Silver Dragon, a level 9 synchro requiring a normal monster non-tuner that gives dragons you control card effect targeting and destruction prevention on summon and can revive a normal monster during each of your standby phases, being clearly intended as a boss for Blue Eyes specifically, but being extremely niche in its applications. Outside of Blue Eyes' specific support, the deck also brought Silver's Cry, a revival spell for dragon normal monsters, and Dragon Shrine, a foolish burial for dragons that can bend two dragons if the first one was a normal monster. Silver's Cry would fall into an extremely niche position on release, but Dragon Shrine would actually see some experimentation in Dragon Ruler specifically thanks to it being able to bend two dragons at once, as the deck already played a normal monster usually in Flamvel Guard to access the double bend effect though this would be niche for a time. Reprints here included Heretic Dragon of Tefnuit, Trade-In, Cards of Consonance, One for One, Monster Reborn, which had just been banned, Fiendish Chain, and Compulse, being a decent wave of staple reprints and useful tools. Following two weeks later would be another first of its kind set, being the Judgment of the Light Deluxe Edition, which is effectively an upgraded version of the previous special editions, but notably held printings of two cards that would be coming in the next core set, being Dragon Shield and Vampire Kingdom, though neither of these cards would be useful. YCS San Mateo would be held a week after that on October 6th, and clearly Dragon Ruler had once again fully taken over, seeing 12 total top spots between its pure and Dragoonity variants, taking first place piloted by Merlin Schumacher on a more pure variant. The Ravine inclusion was no longer a tech, it was now a staple in every version of the deck, marking what would become known as Ravine Ruler format for the remainder of the year, but that distinction was about to get worse we had another Legendary Collection release coming in the next week, and though it appeared to be unassuming, it was about to bring something down on the format that would cause the next two months of the game for some to become absolutely unbearable. Legendary Collection 4, Joey's World. Release date, October 11th, 2013. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, Anything touched by Joey in the original anime. Impact, one import that should have stayed out. Legendary Collection Joey's World is an odd release in retrospect, much like a lot of this year in the game, bringing reprints of a bunch of older DM era cards, many of which are banned, just like Yugi's World before it, but also importing a single OCG card far after its ban in the OCG, which we'll talk about shortly. First of all, the reprints. Jinzo, Fiberjar, Red Eyes Wyvern, Red MD, Raigeki, Monster Reborn, Pot of Greed, Giant Trunade, Premature Burial, Scapegoat, Foolish Burial, Bottomless, Feather Duster, Lava Golem, Mirror Force, Solemn Judgment, The Dark World Core, Necro Valley, Heavy Storm, MST, Rhoda, Super Rejuve, Book of Moon, Pot of Avarice, Trade In, Torrential, Compulse, and Imperial Iron Wall would all be reprinted here, with most of these already being banned in the current format. However, Joey's World also released a card that's been banned for years now that was finally imported from the OCG, being Sixth Sense, a trap that lets you call two results on a die, roll it, and if it's a number you called, you draw that many cards, otherwise milling the result. This card had been banned in the OCG since March of 2005, and when it was printed here, we all expected that that would hold. However, Konami apparently had a different idea. On October 11th, the same day as Joey's World's release, Sixth Sense was put to Limited on the TCG ban list, meaning that, at least until the next ban list, the card was legal to use in the TCG. And I'm sure that that won't cause any kind of issues having a draw 5 or 6 or mill 1 to 4 in a format dominated by a deck that loves to play out of the graveyard. Just two weeks after this, Weekly Shonen Jump Alpha would finally release a promo worth talking about this year, 
being Vulcan the Divine, a level 6 synchro that bounces a card you control and a card the opponent controls on synchro summon, locking you from using that bounced card for the rest of the turn, being a clause clearly placed on it to prevent loops. This would be a solid inclusion to the level 6 synchro pool moving forward, not quite becoming staple but remaining a solid option to include. YCS London would be held three days after that on October 27th and WOW WOULD you LOOK AT THAT! Dragon Rulers had fully gone into overdrive with Sixth Sense becoming legal, completely dominating the event and taking first place piloted by Patrick Ryder, with almost every publicly available list playing the new trap tool. On a much less important note, following that performance was the 5D's manga Volume 5 release, which brought a new take on a classic synchro, being Stardust Spark Dragon, a level 8 that can make a monster unable to be destroyed once in a turn on a quick effect being arguably weaker than the original Stardust but covering a more general spread of circumstances. This would lead us into the last set release of the year, and any hope for Dragon Ruler's reign ending anytime soon would have to rest on its shoulders. Shadow Spectres Release date, November 7th, 2013 Set type, Core Set Major Strategies, Ghostric, Bujin, Noble Knight Impact, nothing until the beast is dropped. Shadow Spectres was the final set release of 2013, and if it wanted to change anything, it really had the wrong card pool to do it, as this particular release would do nothing to the meta overall, merely setting up archetypes for their next waves. Starting with the headliner of the set, Ghost Trick was a series of fiends, spellcasters, and zombies focused on disruption and flipping cards face down, aimed at winning via a war of attrition in a way, with most main deck monsters sharing an effect to flip themselves face down once per turn. This introduction wave included Lantern, able to summon itself from hand face down if the opponent attacks directly or attacks a Ghost Trick, negating the attack, Spectre, able to summon itself from hand face down if a Ghost Trick is destroyed, drawing a card when you do, Zhangxi, able to search a Ghost Trick on flip whose level is less than or equal to your total number of face up Ghost Tricks, Alucard, a rank 3 that can detach to pop a set card on field, Mansion, a field spell that blocks attacking face down monsters and halves battle damage from non ghost trick monsters, and Scare, able to flip any number of your monsters up, then flip monsters the opponent controls face down up to the number of ghost tricks you control. Ghost tricks here would be considered a fun casual level option, but would be nowhere near strong enough to enter the meta, with their most relevant piece being Alucard as a contribution to the rank 3 staple pool. Bujin would receive its second main deck beast warrior in Mikazushi able to summon itself from hand if a Beast Warrior Bujin is destroyed, able to search a Bujin spell trap in the end phase if a Bujin was sent from hand to grave that turn while you controlled it, and Kakutsuchi, a Beast Warrior locked rank 4 that can mill 5 on summon, boosting by 100 for each Bujin milled, able to prevent the destruction of a Beast Warrior Bujin by detaching a material. Just the inclusion of a second main deck Beast Warrior Bujin would increase the power of the deck significantly, though was still unable to perform well in the Dragon Ruler dominated environment. Noble Knights would receive another solid couple of cards and Boars, who was able to become level 5 while equipped with a Noble Arms card, and can reveal 3 Noble Arms in deck to add one at random to hand and put the rest in grave. And Sacred Noble Knight of King Artorgus, a Noble Knight locked rank 5 that equips up to 3 Noble Arms from grave to itself on summon, can detach one to pop a monster on field, and floats into a Noble Knight in grave on destruction. With this release, Noble Knights finally had a solid line to access on turn 1, with Madrat into Boars giving access to the rank 5 pool thanks to Boars grabbing another Noble Arms spell to make Madrat level 5 again. While competent now, Noble Knight would still not be meta. But with this release, the evolution of the TCG exclusive archetypes development process was on display, showing growth in their design space, now aimed at releasing batches of about 5 cards per core set for the current TCG exclusive archetype. While it was too late for Noble Knights to be saved realistically, it gave hope for the next TCG exclusive archetype to be a smash hit. As for some of the other releases here, Labadorite Dragon was another level 6 normal dragon for the Heratic Pool giving the pool a tuner to use for their strategy. Mythic Tree and Water Dragons were a duo clearly intended to work with each other, with Water summoning itself if you control an Earth monster, and Tree able to copy the level of a Water Dragon you control to itself, giving access to a rank 8 by themselves. These would be experimented with in Dragon Rulers, as they could access the rank 8 pool, but also Tree could copy the level of a title onto itself for an additional rank 7 access point. The Baby Raccoon cards would also be released here, being Ponpoko, able to summon a level 2 beast from deck face down on normal summon, Tantan, who summons a level 2 beast from deck on flip, 
and number 64, Ronin Raccoon Sendayu, a beast locked rank 2 that can detach to summon a Kagemusha Raccoon token that matches the attack of the strongest monster on the field on summon. Preventing itself from destruction while you control another beast, being a solid budget rogue level deck to play around with. Divine Dragon Knight Felgrand was a rank 8 that could detach on quick effect to make a monster unaffected by other effects that turn, negating its own effects, being a powerful rank 8 option for the pool. Mistake was a continuous trap that locked adding cards from deck to hand outside of drawing, being a solid side deck floodgate for certain matchups. Grizzail Prison, if you controlled a fusion, ritual, or tribute summoned monster, locks players from synchro and exceed summoning until the end of the opponent's next turn, being an extremely powerful floodgate option for certain strategies. Lastly, White Dragon Wyver Burster and Black Dragon Collapse Serpent were OCG imports that can summon themselves by banishing the other attribute from Grave, searching the other when sent to Grave, being decent options for chaos strategies, not seen play now, but would be heavily considered in the future. Two weeks later would be the second wave of the yearly collectible tens, bringing secret rare versions of Tempest and Redox to finish out the series alongside super rare reprints of Thunder Seahorse, Gear Gig and Dex, Number 50 Black Ship of Corn, Diamond Direwolf, and Spellbook of the Master, reprinting some of the more valuable secret rares in the format in a much easier to access rarity and location. YCS Turin would follow a week after this on December 1st, being the final YCS of the year, and once again, Dragon Ruler would dominate thanks to the combination of Ravine and Sixth Sense, though shockingly would not take the event overall this time. That honor would go to Samuel Padigo on Karakuri Girgia, utilizing similar strategies to before, but now having added in the Girgiano monsters with Girgia gear to flood the board and access their rank fours rapidly. Also utilizing a single copy of Redox as an extra body and a monster reborn of sorts. As for other developments here, Influence Dragon would begin to appear in some Dragon Ruler lists, being a level 3 tuner allowing access to Trident Dragion for sudden OTK pushes. Bujin would see a top here sporting Kaiser Colosseum to even the playing field a bit, able to comfortably sit on just Yamato for turns on end thanks to locking swarming from the opponent. Mythic Wood and Water Dragon would make the occasional appearance here and list to access the rank 8 pool for Dragon Rulers, specifically for Heliopolis, Giant Grinder, and the newly released Felgrand. And with that, 2013 and Yu-Gi-Oh! would come to an end, seeing a bit of a shocking outcome for those who view these formats as Tier 0, as a very interesting result has come to my attention while researching this period. I have long stood as someone who said that the original Dragon Ruler format was not a Tier 0 format, and looking back on the results now, that is true. Prior to any hits, Dragon Ruler only took 31% of the representation in full, 52.5% when adjusted with the unknown list removed, which is far below the standard 65% threshold most Tier 0 formats are qualified by. However, a very interesting result occurs when you analyze the result of Dragon Ruler's post Six Sense release. Of the top 64 spots available in the YCS's following Six Sense's release, Dragon Ruler variants took a shocking 65.6% .6 of the representation, 76.4% if you adjust for the unknown lists, which is above the threshold regardless of how you look at it. So interestingly enough, Dragon Ruler did have a Tier 0 format, just not the one everyone claims is the Tier 0 format, which would be quelled going into 2014, but that's a story for another day. A huge shout out to my Dark Law level patrons, Dammit Marka, Jukes, McJaga, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, and Ryza339, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you'd like to support the channel, consider following me on Patreon, where support tiers start at as little as $1 and you get access to all my videos a day early. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel, that way you don't miss out on any future videos. Every subscription helps out more than you think. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.